Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Michael Gavin. I'm an associate professor in Human Dimensions and Natural Resources here at CSU. Uh, and I am also the convener of uh, the HDNR seminar series. And so this is the first uh, for the semester of the seminar series. I do encourage you to, uh, to come along uh, to, to the other um, seminars that we have throughout the rest of the semester. We have another eight or so seminars coming. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Pippa Norris, uh, who's joining us uh, by Skype. And um, Pippa is uh, the McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics at the uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. She is also an ARC Laureate Fellow and Professor um, of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney in Australia, and a Director of the uh, Electoral Integrity Project, among several other affiliations. Uh, Pippa is one of um, the most influential political scientists today, uh, and some evidence of that is uh, she's one of the most well-cited political scientists, um, and uh, as well has um, published over uh, 45 different books. And if you could just take a quick look at the titles, you'll realize uh, how relevant and perhaps prescient uh, many of her books are. Uh, a few recent titles are Contentious Elections, perhaps sounds familiar, and uh, Why Elections Fail. Uh, Pippa has received um, many different awards, some of the most prestigious international awards given in political science. Most recently among these awards in 2016 was the Brown Medal uh, for Democracy. Also, um, she has done an incredible amount of applied work as well um, on sabbatical. For those coming up with sabbatical, try to beat the sabbatical leave. Um, on sabbatical leave, um, Professor Norris was the Director of Democratic Governance at the United Nations Development Program. So uh, we are uh, very lucky to have uh, Professor Norris uh, with us today. Uh, her talk today is Trump, Brexit, and the Rise of Populism. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Norris. So it's a pleasure to be with you, all of you, even if it's a distance. And Trump and populism has aroused so much concern. There's so many people talking about this. But I think a lot of the debate hasn't really been very well informed. We're still gathering the evidence. We're still understanding. So this paper, which I wrote with Ron Inglehart, provides a theory, a theoretical perspective. And we wrote it first for IPSA last year in July. We gave it then in APSA a month later. And since then, it's taken off so much. It's had so many downloads that we're turning it into a book. And so the thesis is really what's going on with populism. And you've got the two explanations that we need to consider. One is about the economy and the idea that it's the have-nots, it's those who've lost out from globalization. And the other argument, it's a cultural backlash and that it's differences and changes in values over time. So this is work which remains in progress. It's by no means finished. And I really welcome ideas and thoughts as we go through. Uh, just before I go on, can you all hear me okay? I can hear a little bit of echo, but is it sounding okay? We're good? Yes, we're good. We're good. Okay, perfect. So, let's go through. The first part, what is the populist challenge to liberal democracy? And clearly there are many different ways of putting that. Populism in itself is badly understood. We often talk about right-wing populism, left-wing populism, and we need to sharpen our concepts. Secondly, what do we mean by the theory of populism and what are the explanations which are out there? Then what I'm going to do is offer a classification because obviously it's not just about America by any means. Populist parties have been around for decades now, but they have clearly expanded in Europe as well as in Latin America, as well as in Asia and in many other parts of the world. So I'm going to give you a classification to place where populist parties see themselves compared with the traditional left and the traditional right. And then I'm going to look at a little bit of evidence, but again, I'm going to underline this is just the start of this research to see whether or not populist support amongst voters is really associated amongst those who are the least economically secure. So amongst the poorest groups, amongst those who are unemployed, amongst those who are on state benefits, or whether instead it's about a cultural backlash which is associated above all by age and gender as well as education. Is that the big gap which is really explaining populist voting? And then the conclusions. So let's start with the populist challenge. Everybody living in America knows about the challenges which we now have in American government. During the campaign, 
People often dismiss Trump in terms of rhetoric. They said, well, yes, he says that, but he doesn't actually mean it. And we now know that many of the things which he said in the nativist rhetoric, in the Made America First, in the sense of isolationism, in the policies which he put forward in terms of immigration and xenophobia, aren't just ideas which were there for popular appeal, but are actually very much part of what seems to be the governing agenda, which has been developed even just in the last two weeks. But it's not just an American phenomenon by any means. In fact, in some ways, America is catching up with what happened in other countries. The other shock, of course, which occurred very recently was Brexit and the way in which the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom Independence Party in particular influenced the challenge through the referendum process. And again, this was a tremendous surprise. It was a shock to Europe. It was a shock to people in Britain. It was a very close result, but it has had shock waves throughout the continent. And it also is evident in many other parties. We've got the French presidential election going on right now, and Marine Le Pen, who's taken over from her father, is, is in second place in many of the polls, around 25%. Uh, other candidates come and go. It depends on what's going to happen in the next few weeks. But nevertheless, it seems quite likely that she'll come second in that. And then there's the Chamber of Deputies election just fairly soon after that. And in other countries, we have the Swiss People's Party, in Austria, the Freedom Party, the, even in Sweden, in Greece, in Italy, in the Netherlands, in Poland, in Venezuela, in, in Hungary, there have been really the rise of populism. This summarizes the data. If you can see the chart, in terms of the share of the votes, this shows us across different European countries, the share of the vote and the share of the seats in the 1970s, which I've aggregated across a range of countries, and again in the 2000 period. And you can see what's happened in both cases, popular support has tripled. Now, people like Kasmud argue that there's still often minor parties, which is true. Some of them have come and gone. Often they're flash parties, they're protest parties. But the fact that the party support has gone up by three times the amount, the fact that they've now entered parliaments, that they've now entered governments and government coalitions is a major change in their electoral fortunes. And again, the European parties said once Trump has been elected that this was clearly an example for them which they might want to emulate. So what is populism? What have all these parties got in common? And I think in particular that there are these three components. The first, which is common in every definition, is a challenge to the establishment. And by the establishment, what they're emphasizing above all is that it's about the popular view of ordinary people, that they are the ones with the experience, with the wisdom and the virtue. They're the ones who should be engaged in politics compared with the establishment who are seen as corrupt. And it's a very broad group that populists are, are against. It's not just people in government, it's also big government, big banks, big corporations, multinationals. It's about the traditional mainstream media and distrust of the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN, a mistrust clearly of those who are in elected office, whether they're in Congress or whether they're in parliaments or whether they're in local government, government officials, bureaucrats, pen pushers, intellectuals and experts. I'm afraid more as everybody in this room, probably uh, populists are against or critical of. Uh, and the rich and the privileged are part of that as well. Beyond that, though, what else do they have in common? Well, particularly what one finds is a set of values. So anti-establishment says that populists are challenging the institutions of liberal democracy, but what do you put in its place? And unfortunately, what populism does is often open the door to authoritarian leaders. Once you start to challenge mainstream parties, once you say that elected politicians are corrupt, then it basically gives a platform that a leader who can stand for the people, who can speak for the people, who doesn't necessarily get corrupted by being part of government, can therefore act in their place. And we often find, therefore, strong charismatic leaders. We can think of, for example, in, in, in many of these different countries, leaders who have been very well known who see themselves as a direct voice of the virtuous people. And as a result, this delegitimizes, it takes away the authority of liberal democracy checks and balances. 
So it has very dangerous tendencies by really undermining established forces. It can be positive, it can mean that this can lead to political reforms, but it can be negative, particularly if human rights are, dis are dismantled and there are other basic issues which are against um, common values. And then the third element, I think, particularly for authoritarian populism, is this idea of nativism, which is a bundle. Now, we've always mentioned things like race and the importance of race in American politics, and that's part of it. The diatribe against Mexicans, the diatribe against Muslims, Islamophobia is part of it, but it's part of a broader philosophy, a zeitgeist. And it's about monoculturalism versus multiculturalism. It's about isolationism and withdrawing from international agencies versus being part of international global governance, whether that's the UN, whether it's the European Union, whether it's NATO, whether it's NAFTA. It's about, in particular for Trump, national self-interest. That's the pr process by which he sees the prism of all other countries. For example, yesterday, being critical of Australia, one of the closest allies to America, because the particular deal he thought wasn't in America's interests. Closed borders, intolerance of outsiders, however that's defined, and traditional values, meaning traditional values towards the family, towards women. Um, yesterday, apparently, the White House issued a, a, a little um, statement that all the people working there had to wear, all the women had to wear uh, women's clothes, whatever that meant. <laughs> okay. Um, I know. Um, and of course, we've seen the environmental issues as well. Uh, yesterday, again, the governmental um, executive order saying that they're rolling back on things like um, the role of, uh, clean, uh, of the coal industry in, in, in America's streams and deregulation of other things, for example, on the big banks. So it's a range of different things that come together. And all of this is populism. Um, in a broad sense, but we're still getting our head around that. And there are populist progressives, I want to emphasize that. Again, think of Bernie Sanders. He was a populist, but he stood for values on things like tolerance of LGBT rights or gender equality, which are very progressive, but at the same time, he was also anti-big banks and anti-corporations. So what explains this phenomenon, which has been sweeping so many countries? A full explanation, I think, has these three building on the one hand, if you're trying to compare where populists have made advances compared with where they haven't, you have to take account of the institutional rules of the game. These are really important. So think of things like the electoral system and voting thresholds. In America, think of things like the electoral college and the way that was out of um, sync with the popular vote. In other countries, things like a proportional electoral system lets the small parties get into power and get into coalitions. Then you also have, on this demand side, the values and attitudes of the mass electorate. Do they support these values or are they critical of them? And then you have supply side, which is how the parties compete. So, for example, when you get a, a small populist party, what happens to the mainstream parties on the right and left? Do they try and accommodate them? Or, they try, or do they try and have a cordon sanitaire, which keeps them out of power? Different parties have reacted in different ways, but that's the party competition along Downsian lines. So I'm not going to talk about all of those. I'm going to focus on demand side and give you a bit of evidence for that. So there are two explanations on the demand side. The first one has a long history, and it goes right back to the end of the Second World War, some of the fathers of political sociology. And we're talking about work by those like Seymour Martin Lipset or by Daniel Bell. And it developed in reaction to Weimar Germany, as well as Pujartism in France, McCarthyism and intolerance in the United States. And what this one says is that it's based on class and an authoritarian reaction against the threats. In particular, in the 50s, the, the big role of the growth of big business and multinational corporations and the threat of organized labor. And the idea was that there was a group in the middle, the petty bourgeoisie, that was threatened by both of these large sectors. And the petty bourgeoisie, the small farmer, farmer the small shopkeeper, was the one who would be the base, social base of support for the rise of fascism and the support for uh, Pujartism in France. 
The modern argument says a similar kind of economic explanation that what we're seeing is a reaction against globalization. The opening of borders economically, the opening of markets, the downward mobility of manufacturing industry, and the loss of blue collar jobs might provide a social basis for the support for Trump and for the National Front and for UKIP. If you look, for example, at where Brexit uh, people voted in Britain, very much the north of England, not Scotland, but the north of England in some industrial areas was ones where clearly Brexit leavers resided. The Remain Remainers were much more in urban metropolitan London, in areas which have benefited from globalization. Similarly, in America, we know that rural America, and in particular, non-urban America, so we look at the map, we know that Clinton support was strong in California, it was strong in New York, but throughout much of the middle America, in particular the Rust Belt, which was meant to be the blue wall, crumbled. So if the explanation is economic, it really says the evidence should be that when we look for populist support, it should be the economically marginalized, it should be the blue collar workers, the unemployed, people who are living on welfare benefits, those living in areas with um, high levels of unemployment or deprivation, and those who feel economically insecure. And when you think about it, that has some positive implications. In particular, what it says is that the left, the Democratic Party, can overcome Trump by going back to some of their roots, and by rebuilding some of those traditional social democratic policies that might appeal to those groups. But there's a second explanation, and this is the one which is called cultural backlash. And this relates in particular to the early work which Ronald Inglehart, my colleague, did about cultural change. Now, everybody's familiar, I think, with his early work in The Silent Revolution, which was written in the late 70s. And his argument was, and still is, that there's been the rise of progressive values from the 70s onwards, especially amongst young people, especially amongst the educated living in affluent countries. And in this view, many, many attitudes have been gradually changing as a result of population shifts. So attitudes, for example, towards gay marriage. Think about the attitudes 20 years ago and think about the attitudes today. We've moved from the era of madmen to the era of modern family. Think about attitudes towards gender equality and sex roles. Think about attitudes towards environmental protection. Think about attitudes towards cosmopolitan connections and how much people feel part of the world versus just being part of their community. Think about diversity of lifestyles and tolerance and attitudes towards development and so on. All of these have often been seen as positive developments, but what's happened, and which Inglehart said from a very early stage, is that there was always a group that lost out from these changes. That many of us might be in favor of them, but they push back on many of the core values of many Americans, in particular the less educated, in particular the older generation. And so what might have happened, and this is our theory, is that a tipping point might have been reached. And in particular, what was seen as the predominant values in America in the 1950s and 1960s, when people look around, are no longer the values which are being held today. And so people feel that their values are under threat, whether they're the values, for example, of religion and the importance of that versus secularization, whether they're the values of the traditional family and marriage versus a wide variety of other lifestyles, whether they're the values uh, which were there in terms of patriotism and faith and nationalism. All of those are things which have been changing, and all of those are things which a group of the sector of Americans and Europeans might think they're losing out. So if the majority now feels that it's under threat, it might be expressing that politically and it might be a, a broad group who's very open to the appeal of populists, the nostalgic appeal that we can make America great again. What's being symbolized? It is an appeal, I think, to the 1950s and the 1960s. And again, when, we, when Trump uses 
um, language against Mexicans, against Muslims, against the threat of terrorism. Again, for me, that's a nostalgic appeal to the idea that America was white and they were the majority population and that therefore there were certain values which that embodied amongst uh, certain groups of the sector. And when in particular, as we know, there are a range of new sociological studies, anthropological studies, which say that many Americans living in rural communities feel that they're no longer respected, that again echoes this broad sense. If values have changed, many people don't respect the older values. People have moved on. So there are new culture wars, but that the groups feel threatened by that, and we have to remember who votes. So the social changes which have been going on in values are a little out of step with the electorate. Younger people are more tolerant of progressive values, but they're less likely to vote, more likely to protest. Older people and the less educated are more likely to hold these values, but they're also more likely to participate. The gap by age group in participation is enormous, as it always has been. So if this is true, populism should be evident and to be broken down by generation, by both birth cohort, and by other things like religion, religiosity, education, sex, as well as by authoritarian values. So what we need to do is first classify some parties and then look at some evidence. Now, we don't have evidence yet which is really good in America. We will in a few months when we get the American National Election Survey, we get some other uh, good data which is available. But what we can do is we can look at some European data to look at parents. So when we classify parties, we would normally classify them either to the left or to the right, either in favour of the state or in favour of markets. And what we're saying is that what we now have is these new set of values which appeals, and what we're labeling, labeling them as is cosmopolitan liberals. All of those values I just talked about, the progressive changes, which obviously includes environmentalism and protection, a belief in climate change, a belief in science, as well as a belief in pluralist democracy, tolerance and multiculturalism, multilateral engagement, progressive values, and against that comes populism. So what we're saying is that there's a new cultural cleavage. As the parties on the left and the right have come to the centre, social democratic and conservative or Christian democratic parties who were battling over the role of the state and the markets, as that cleavage is less important, so this new cultural cleavage has emerged, which pits those who are in favor of populism versus those who are in favor of cosmopolitan liberalism. And this cleavage is one where the parties are reorganizing and where they're getting new support. Now, how do we measure that? What we can do is we can take what's known as CHES. CHES is the Chapel Hill study which looks at all parties and it classifies where parties place themselves in manifestos and party platforms on these basic values. And so it asks experts to rate parties on things like, on 10-point scales, where do you place parties in your country, on traditional values, liberal social lifestyles, nationalism, law and order, multiculturalism, and so on. And then it also asks where parties are placed on the left-right spectrum. For example, do parties favour market deregulation, state economic interventions, wealth redistributions, and so on. When you do that, you get a map of all parties, and I know this is very small, but it looks like this. Okay, now, remember what we've got is the same cleavages. So, on the one side, on the right, we've got the parties which see themselves as right-wing on the market, and those are often some traditional conservative parties, Christian democratic parties as well. And then we have some parties on the left, like old communist parties, basically they're, they're protecting welfare, and they're protecting redistribution. At the bottom, you've got various green parties, environmental parties, liberal parties with a small L, who see they're very progressive in their values in a variety of different countries. And then at the top, in the high um, oval, which I've highlighted, we have what I term populist parties. So these parties can be on the left economically or on the right. You get parties like 
the Bulgarian Attica Party, Hungarian Jobbik, who are on the right of economic issues, but they're very nationalist. They want to close borders, they want to build walls. Greek parties also can be in that category, for example. They were, again, economically left-wing, but very nationalist. And on the, on the other side, we see populist right-wing parties, which are parties like UKIP, uh, the UK Independence Party, the German uh, uh, Alternative for Democracy, now challenging Angela Merkel, parties in Sweden, parties in France, parties in Luxembourg, parties in Italy. All of these are parties on the right. So, that's a new classification of political parties, and it says that these parties are ones which are basically common in their cultural attitudes, but they differ in their economic attitudes. So, with what predicts whether people support the parties on this populist group? First, let me emphasize that when, when we look at the issues, what's happening is that non-economic issues have been rising in importance and economic issues have been declining, just as we're predicting. This shows us the salience in how parties present themselves in their platforms and manifestos, right the way back from the early period of the 1980s through to 2010. And all of these are based on what parties emphasize when they make promises to voters. And we can see that economic issues were critical in the early period, and they continue for many years to be the most important ones. Where does the party stand on welfare? Where does the party stand on the state? But that from, in particular, the early 80s onwards, it's non-economic issues, it's everything else. Foreign policy, culture, and a wide range of social policy issues emerge as more important. <coughs> So what's the evidence that it's about economics? What's the evidence that it's about culture? What we can do is we can look at what predicts the people support those populist parties. First, let's take the issue of class. Now, we often talk about class quite loosely in America, but this is a classification which is based on people's occupation, and we've got five different categories. We have the traditional working class, the blue collar workers. We have the foreman and technicians who are the skilled working class. The petty bourgeoisie, these are groups like self-employed plumbers, self-employed electricians, people who run small businesses, small shopkeepers. We have the routine, not manual, that's the pink collar sector. And then we have the salariat, who's the professionals, the managers, the highest economic class. And on the vertical axis, what we have is the percentage who voted for populist parties in Europe using all of those party classifications which I suggested. And I've got the pooled European Social Survey as my data set, which has something like 20, uh, 28 countries pulled together. What do you see? Well, immediately, as you can see, the people who have been voting for populist parties in Europe is not the richest group, of course. It's not the professionals. It's not the middle class. But nor is it the working class. It's not those who are in blue collar jobs or in that particular sector. Instead, just like it was in the 1950s, it's actually the petty bourgeoisie. It's the group in the middle. It's the group who might feel threatened by both of these groups. And as we'll see if we look, for example, in the American data available through the exit polls, there's a remarkably similar pattern between this and the groups that supported Clinton and the groups that supported Trump. Again, it was not the worst off who supported Trump. That group, on 50,000 per capita, voted Clinton. So the economic explanation, which you hear all the time, is not necessarily supported by this European evidence. By contrast, look at the pattern by cohort of birth. And again, we've got the same uh, a basic pattern that we're looking at, the cohort of birth breaks down the population by the year in which they're born, their grandparents, their parents, and then the millennial generation, the younger groups. And as you can see, the older generation consistently are the ones who are most likely to support populists in Europe. It goes down throughout the baby boomers, 
And in the millennial generation, it's least likely to support populist parties. Well, you might well say, this is fine, but do we need um, a regression analysis to look at this in more detail? And of course we do. I'm going to put the figures up, but the figures are going to be quite small, and I know that you all hate them anyway, so I'll just basically highlight the key factors. And we can see whether these factors remain robust when we control for lots of other things. And all of these figures are available in the paper, and you can download the whole paper from the research uh, website at Harvard. I'll give you the slide again so you can look at it in some detail. Here's what the figures look like. So first, what I do, we're again explaining support who voted for populist parties in Europe using the European Social Survey. I first put in, in my first model, a range of controls for somebody's age, their sex, their education, the strength of their religion, and whether or not they're an ethnic minority. And all of those behave just as you would expect. So the older voters are more likely to support populists. It's positive and it's significant. The older you are, the more you vote for them. Men are more likely to vote populist than women. And that's been a consistent pattern for years and years. It doesn't matter which study you look at. It's men who have this idea that they're voting for populists, not the women. It's no accident, by the way, that when you look at these photos of the Trump administration, it's all just men standing around thinking about women's reproductive rights. <laughs> Education? Of course, it's the less educated, as we know time and time again, who've been voting for, for Trump and who vote for these parties. What we don't know is why the less educated are voting. And education can work in lots of different ways. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's class. I think there's a distinction between education and class. Religiosity, the more religious, the more you vote populist. Ethnic minorities, of course, in Europe, if you're an ethnic minority of whatever persuasion, you're less likely to vote. All of those things are kind of predictable. Let's add in a range of economic indicators. So we put in class, we put in whether you are unemployed, we put in whether you live on social benefits, whether you feel insecure, and whether you are living in a degree of urbanization. And the results are somewhat mixed. As I said, class doesn't work in terms of the poorest, least well-off sectors, blue-collar workers voting for most strongly for populists. That's not the case. Unemployed, yes. There is some indication that if you're unemployed in Europe, you're more likely to support populists. But if you live on welfare benefits, you're less likely to. So again, that's rather mixed evidence. People who have got all sorts of welfare benefits in Europe are less likely to vote populist, not more likely. Economic insecurity predicts it somewhat. Urbanization goes the other way. And again, in America, we have to say, if it was purely an economic explanation, then it should be the inner city urban areas which vote for Trump. And that obviously was not the case when we look at where the counties voted for Trump. Well, what about the cultural indicators? And here I put in a range of different indicators along with my controls. So was somebody anti-immigrant? Did somebody mistrust the United Nations and European Union? Were they mistrusting of their national government? Were they holding authoritarian values towards women, towards minorities, towards race? And were they on the left-right scale? All of those are consistent. So even after I control for education, and age, those attitudes are strong predictors of whether somebody voted populist. But let me emphasize that this is all work in progress, and in particular, when I try interaction models, because there's likely to be an interaction going on, the, st the situation does get more complicated. So we've been working on other data sets, and we've been thinking through some of the classifications to see this, and whether these patterns exist more broadly. What about some narrative? Is there evidence at all yet that these patterns are consistent? I'm just going to give you a couple of slides, and I'm going to emphasize that these are largely in line with the evidence we have so far. So this shows us some quite good surveys from Pew that were conducted during the campaign. And this broke down the demographics by a variety of different categories, and you can see the support for Clinton and the support for Trump. So obviously there's the gender gap, now, that is complicated by this and by age and by education. But nevertheless, as we know, there's been a gender gap in American politics since 1980, where women are consistently more in favor of 
uh, the Democrats, and that persisted. The, the pattern by this is no surprise, of course. Um, we all know what Trump just said when, of course, he made remarks about Frederick Douglass and various other things about how he won the black vote. I don't know what he was smoking, but really, it really is there. <laughs> In any shape or form, he won the black vote. Uh, this is absolute nonsense, along with a variety of other claims. Age is really interesting. If only people under 44 had voted for uh, at all, then Clinton would have won the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. If only people over 44 had voted, then Trump would have won the popular vote. It's consistent and it's a pattern which exists, which is very clear. Education, you can see the gap for yourself. Good predictor and of course partisanship um, is there as well. And it's not just the Pew survey which shows this. Um, again, let's look, let's look back what's been changing. And here's the age pattern. And Pew looked at the age pattern in 2008, 2012, 2016, in the same period. And of course, Obama won young people. We know that. But he was young. He was in his, he was in his 40s. And he was, you know, the cool president in 2008, slightly more great head in 2012. But look at what happens to the age gap. It expands. And let's face it, whatever Hillary Clinton was, she was not exactly a spring chicken. She was not somebody who was fashionable. She was not somebody who was cool. But she got the uh, younger voters in the polls. And as we can see again, if you look at the elder groups, uh, solidly in Republican favor. The Economist has similar patterns, et cetera, et cetera. And I can break all of this down by the exit polls. The exit polls had their problems. But what we're really waiting for is the American National Election Survey, the Cooperative Congress Survey, and a variety of other data sources that's going to come available in the next two months. And then we're going to have a much better handle. We know that all the polls have got problems, but if consistently we find these across polls done by Gallup, by Pew, and by the NES, and by NORC, then we've got something that we think is really coming out from the American data, and that does seem consistent with the pattern which we have in Europe. So I really want to open it up for questions, but let me just summarize what we've found and what we're where we're going. The debate does continue between those who think that it's globalization. And in the, in the Kennedy School, for example, Danny, Danny Roderick still argues that case, and those who believe it's a cultural backlash. And I don't think we've yet nailed this down properly. I think we're still looking, we're still sifting through the evidence. But we can certainly see that certain demographic, fac demographic factors and cultural attitudes are strong predictors when we pool the evidence across a wide variety of parties in Europe. And economic inequality is not unimportant. And in particular, we've written a piece for Perspectives where we emphasize that it's economic insecurity, which often drives the values as well as gender, which in turn leads to support for populism. But the closest predictor is very much these cultural issues, which we see as a retrospective backlash against the values that were dominant in America and were dominant in Europe 20 or 30 years ago. What was the majority opinion is now no longer the majority opinion. And that threat has heightened the generational gaps in the electorate. Now, we need to do a number of other things. In particular, we need to split our surveys because there are potential differences between the populist left and the populist right, between the Bernie Sanders supporters and the Trump supporters. And that needs further analysis. We need to demonstrate the tipping point thesis, which we haven't yet managed to do, but we're recoding some of the Eurobarometer data so that we will have annual trends to be able to understand that. And then we also need qualitative case studies, because again, these are parties which have risen and sometimes fallen in particular countries. So none of this is new. We have had populists, of course, in the past in America. Think about Huey Long. Think about George Wallace. Both of those could be seen to be precedents to, to Donald Trump. France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Venezuela, Hungary, all very different cases but all important cases for understanding this phenomenon. If we know, for example, why Hugo Chavez rose to power in Venezuela, that's a very important model 
for what's going on right now in the United States. And we need further controls. And we need to look also at what parties are doing as well as what the public is doing, because both of those are important. How parties respond to this phenomena, do they absorb the issues or do they keep all a coalition with the cordon sanitaire? And then the actual understanding and, and, and the modeling of our, um, our evidence needs further robustness checks, of course. And if you want the details of the work, go to the faculty working paper, which you can download from um, the Kennedy School of Government and from my website as well, and you can find more details. The book is probably going to go to bed uh, with the publisher in August, so we're still in process. We're still working through a lot of different issues. All of this is absolutely critical for the future of liberal democracy in America. And those are questions which are continuing to evolve. And all of that colors our thinking about multiple issues. But really, it's a work in progress. This is one explanation which I think is plausible but it's still not totally proven. But it's open to everybody to think about these issues and then to think, if it is a cultural backlash, what do we do? And here I've had many agencies come to me and, and say, we think you're telling the right story, probably. What do we do? And I just don't have a simple answer. If it's economics, yes, we can improve the infrastructure, we can rebuild some communities, we can put back jobs, even though, by the way, jobs are actually at a, almost an a all-time low, 4.8% unemployment rates. But how we change the culture, if we're at loggerheads on the culture, because in particular, I don't think that the urban liberal areas of America are willing to give respect to attitudes which are racist, to attitudes which reflect attitudes of America first versus a broader understanding of our international relations, or that they're willing to disregard evidence on climate change, or that they're willing to compromise on a range of values which people hold very strongly towards gay rights, towards women, and towards minorities. They're just not issues which people are willing to compromise on, or even to give respect for. So I don't know how we bring America back together again on those issues, if it's possible. And I don't know how the Democrats respond. And when people say, for example, the Democrats should get rid of identity politics and abandon their commitment, I just don't think that's possible. I think it's too much part of the DNA of the Democratic Party. And on the, the values of respect for human rights and liberal democracy, these aren't values that most people are prepared to compromise on. So I have to end on a rather bleak note, I'm afraid. Um, but I you know, welcome your thoughts and ideas uh, and pushback on both the analytical side and some of the darker sense, the conclusion about where America is heading uh, right now. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much. Um, we, we do have some time for some questions. What I would ask, if you're going to ask a question, given our Skype format here, is if you could actually give some people some exercise, actually get up and come out to the front here um, to, to be able to ask a question. That way, that way people can actually see who's asking the question and, and hear a lot better. So with that, we can start. We might have a question we'd like to start with. Um, hi, Pippa. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. I have a question that's kind of multifaceted, multi-part. Um, as I was listening to a lot of the features of the populist movement, what came to mind were a lot of socialist, potentially fascist, revolutionary movements in the developing world throughout the 1960s through the 1980s. Um, I'm curious, first off, if you also see the similarity. Um, second, if you can comment on how the features of populism have shaped social movements, um, mm. you know, throughout potentially the last century. And additionally, if, um, you know, considering the fact that, that age is definitely a factor um, within a growing populist movement, if there's anything that history can tell us um, as far as 
ways in which to anticipate or react to potential mobilizing social movements. Okay. Sounds good. Do you, Michael, did you want to take a couple of questions in a, in a group, say two or three, and then I can respond? Uh, if you'd like, no. that's, that's up to you. Yeah, that's good, because yeah. that way we get a few on the table, maybe. And okay. that gives opportunities. Sure, no problem. If others, want, if others have questions, you just come, come into the center and we can just kind of form a queue here. Hi, Dr. Norris, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'll, I'll throw another <laughs> question on the pile. Um, mine was more for uh, what do you think about the, the reliance on poll data? Um, both, dur both oh. during the campaign and now, um, and how that, to me, really failed to predict accurately the results of our election. I mean, 538, which I take to be pretty data-centric and data-conscious, also oh. had Trump at something like 6% of chance of victory going into the election. So is there is there a way to change that? Is there a way to find more reliable data sources about um, what people are really thinking about these issues? Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we'll take, take one more, Pippa, that's all right, and yep, then we can great. give me a chance to answer. Um, hello, uh, nice to meet you, and this is more a few comments I had as I was listening to your presentation. So I uh, got from your presentation that the assumption was that more than likely it was a cultural backlash, which um, was responsible for Trump's election. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I remember just like towards your like, concluding comments, you were mentioning how you're not sure how that's an easy fix. Um, especially considering the fact that you don't think a majority of like the people who are here, for example, who mostly are white, would support, you know, racism. They wouldn't support, you know, these things. Um, and I guess just from my experience, because I was very involved with the election process, I was like working for Bernie Sanders and stuff like that. Um, I guess what I saw that really led, um, and of course, this is just my personal opinion. This doesn't really explain exactly why things happen. But in my personal opinion, I felt like a big reason why this happened was because a lot of people who are kind, people who care, who aren't racist, didn't really feel immediately threatened and felt it was very unlikely it would happen. I know I talked to uh, several of my bosses when I was at work and mentioned, oh, like, I think this is a big deal. And they're like, oh, I doubt Trump will win. Like, he's not going to win. And even young, um, I had a few young um, classmates of mine who were white who didn't feel at all threatened by Trump because they're like, oh, even if he, like, he doesn't mean it. Like, I know some who voted for Trump, they're like, well, we're voting for him, but he doesn't really mean it when he talks about these minorities, these uh, religious ban, things like that. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. But well, let's, let's go back on some of these. So, obviously, we've got two related issues. One is about the polls getting it wrong. And of course, it wasn't just in America where they got it wrong. I mean, I was sitting here with, with election night with my party, like you were as well, watching this arrow <laughs> started off at 87%, right, with uh, Clinton was going to win, and then it went down. People said, oh, 70%, oh, 60%, and then it, we were all watching the New York Times and so on. So the polls were disastrous in terms of that. Of course, it was a close election. We have to remember that. And before that, Brexit, Brexit, the polls were totally wrong as well. And again, a very close election. So it really raises questions, and it raises questions for France. They've banned polls in the coming uh, presidential election in May because they, think, they don't believe them. They think that's say um, France 24 has, I mean, there are still polls being published. But people think that maybe there's uh, all sorts of factors, in particular with populist parties, which meant that they weren't very accurate. One is the turnout is absolutely critical in both events. And all you need to have is one side that's passionate and energized and is actually going to turn out so even if the other side said, yes, I support Clinton or I support Sanders, they just stayed her. And polls are not very good at predicting turnout. So that's, a, that's an issue which I think really, pollsters have to really look into. The Market Research Society in Britain did a, uh, a, a thing afterwards, after the election, a post-mortem, and they said that it was partly that issue of how you predict who's going to vote. So I think polls don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. When we're asking um, basic questions on attitudes, we can assume that that's easier to monitor and more accurate than it is how somebody's going to vote and whether they're going to vote, which is the critical question that we're trying to find out for the actual election result. But I, I absolutely agree with that last comment, which is that we all went into the election expecting that Hillary would win because that was the predominant, I think even Donald Trump, expected that Hillary would. And certainly the Democrats um, 
totally believed that from most of their polling data um, as they went into the election. So the polls had a result. The polls had an impact. And I think people discounted Donald Trump as a, uh, you know, the classic cliche is that um, the supporters treated him seriously, but not literally. And the critics treated Trump literally, but not seriously. And now what we're all doing is realizing that we have to treat him both literally and seriously. The things that he said are the things that he's doing. And it was kind of in some ways an accident that he got into the White House. We know that the popular vote was very tight. We know that it was about three states where basically the popular vote didn't mobilize in the way that it could have mobilized. And that if, for example, the Clinton campaign had only pushed on those in a better campaign mode with better strategy, they might have gone their way. We know that Clinton won the popular vote by about three million. So again, it was the, the electoral college and the way that the, the, the votes fell out which produced the result. But the result is, even if it was accidental to some extent, it's real. And therefore, the things which he said are the things which he's now implementing in every single shape or form. I heard the press conference this morning from Spicer, and he said so far there have been 60 different actions the administration has taken, and he laid out all the things that they're going to be doing as well. So for the international relations, which is one of the most dangerous things, we see the consequences. For regulation and for domestic politics, we see the consequences. For immigration, you'll have seen the most recent headline in the Washington Post, which is that 100,000 people have been affected by the cancellation of their visas. Um, and, you know, we're going to have four years of this. So um, nobody really expected the result that came out. I don't think even the Republicans didn't expect it. And they, most people have discounted his seriousness because they saw him as a celebrity. But the consequence is going to be with us for years and years and they're going to change America. On, on the first point, um, are there precedents? Absolutely. And so, again, we need to think. Now, populism in America has a very interesting history. And again, that's why a lot of people push back when people first started talking about Trump to populists, because it was a progressive movement at the turn of the 19th century. And it was there to, to basically clean up politics, to get corruption, and to really improve things. And I do think there's still populists in Europe who I would term progressive populists. And they are like Spain's Podemos. And they are like, in particular, the Italian uh, Five Star Movement, who are also very progressive on a number of issues. And there is a lot of corruption in politics. There is a, a sense that the institutions aren't working, and that therefore populism, by like setting a torch and being an insurgent, can try and improve and, and, and make us benefit from better institutions. I mean, part of the reason for Trump was simply that Congress was stalemated, and polarization meant that nothing could be done under a large part of administration of Obama administration second term. So there's a positive, kind of a positive thing and an underlying current. The problem is that even that, when it throws out the establishment, throws out the checks and balances, and if you discredit the source of information like the independent media, if you discredit the role of, of politicians, and if you discredit both the major parties, it leaves a power vacuum. And that is the most dangerous aspect of populism that you're, you're basically opening the door to strongman leaders. And strongman leaders which are in a time when authoritarians are also in resurgence. So it does seem to me rather like the interwar years, uh, the period of the um, first reverse wave in democratization, as Sam Huntington used to talk about, or the period of the 1960s to 70s, when many newly independent decol decolonized countries started off with democratic parliamentary institutions that they collapsed because they weren't institutionalized. So I think we're in a period of um, recession for democracy. And it's around like we've had seven fat years, basically even longer than that, 1973 through to about 2005. And that since then, there's been a, a short a, a decline, or at least indications of stasis for democratization around the world. And this is going to accelerate it. This is going to accelerate it through a couple of things. One is that if America is no longer supporting democratic ideals and values and democracy promotion, then clearly that's going to be less widely funded in countries around the world. And then as an example, again, if America goes back on human rights, for example, the right to refugees, or if it, it renegades on promises on international obligations, on trade, or if it turns back on issues like the use of torture, 
then that's going to send the wrong signal and it's going to empower Putin's Russia, it's going to empower China, and it's going to empower many other forces around the world which uh, applaud um, these developments, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. We have time for a couple more questions still. We had a few people yes. that were lined up in the middle. That's all right. And do say your name when you say a question. That way I know who you are. Hi, my name is Mordecai Ogada. I'm from Kenya. So maybe I don't know as much about the U.S. perspective. But my question is on populism. How much of it is about what someone does and how much of it is about capture by, by the person? Because like in France, Marine Le Pen, I've read in certain places that it's uh, part of her eyes might be that she's uh, slightly better looking than her father. Also, if you look at the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, um, yeah. his actions do not seem to be the sort of thing that would draw people to him. So there seems to be yeah. some element of capture. And I also wonder if anyone other than Donald Trump could have won the US presidency saying what he said. Right. right. Yeah. Thank right. you. Good point. Yes. You want to take one, one other one at the same time? Sure, absolutely. If there's another question. We have one, we have one other question. Okay. Um, yeah, if not, yeah. We have, we, we've got one, one more coming up. One more coming up. Yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Um, we w I wanted to ask you about the current events in European Union and United States. What kind of message are they going to send to the part of Europe that is usually forgotten, for example, Eastern Europe, especially the situation in Ukraine? No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So two, two good points. So the first one, the trouble is that the, the, the person is the party in so many of these cases, which is both strength and a weakness. So it really means that if that person manages to take over a party with a hostile bid, which is essentially what happened when Trump took over the Republican Party, then their personality and their beliefs and their values colors the rest of the party unless there's pushback. So in many of these cases, their personality and their values are at the heart of what they're going to push. Now, it may well be that in the next few months, there is further resistance amongst the GOP to some of the policies. And we can see that on some issues. So you may have seen that immediately that Australia was offended by the personal phone call with Donald Trump. Um, uh, McCain stood, you know, said, oh, we apologize on behalf of the Americans. And on a number of other issues, there has been some pushback by some, like Susan, Maine, uh, Susan Collins of, 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 um, of Maine. And more moderate wings, I think, are there in the party. On the other hand, waiting for the GOP to push back on a number of these other issues, I'm not sure that we should hold our breath in the short run in particular. He's got a honeymoon. For the first time, the GOP feel that they're in power in both sides of the House and in the White House, and that they need to, they need to give him credit for that, and that they can work with him, and they can get their issues through if Trump gets his issues through and make a, a compromise. The Democrats seem to be all over the place. I cannot see them standing up. They do not know what they're doing. And they make kind of half-hearted attempts on some things. Like they say, we're going to, you know, boycott the, um, the committee. And then, of course, <laughs> the committee votes the way it's going to vote, even when they're not in the room. They're trying to have a, you know, they're trying to stop the education uh, secretary getting through. But even there, they're not really unified. So I'm afraid we're going to have to look to the courts for opposition to Trump right now and to civic society, which brings up the other point about mobilization. We have to remember that the marches haven't finished. They've just started. More and more people in general are willing to protest. But the march that we had for women was just remarkable in the number of women, not just, of course, in America and not just in the urban areas, but the number who turned out. I'm sure many of you many in the room turned out for the Women's March uh, on some on, on Saturday? Yeah. Oh, now that's interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. I was going to say, if I only had one hand, then I'd be somewhat worried. But the, number, the millions of people who turned out um, 
in, in D.C., so they couldn't even march. The millions who turned out in Boston, the millions who turned out in San Francisco, that's not what's remarkable. They turned out in every city across America. There are estimates it was three million. And they're still turning out in Europe. My friends in Edinburgh, my friends in Glasgow, my friends in, Lo in London, and in Sydney. I mean, the fact that people are mobilized so strongly says that Trump has touched a nerve and it's not going to go away. So civil society, if you go on Twitter, I, I haven't yet seen any proper data, but I do think that before the election, it was the Trump forces who were really predominant on Twitter. My impression is that that has somewhat reversed. I need to have some good evidence for that. But I think that social media are where the resistance is being mobilized quite effectively. And of course, as Trump said, the real opposition is in the newspapers. It's basically the Washington Post and the New York Times, and they're the ones who are standing up to him day after day. On the other hand, they're the one who've been standing up to him day after day for our campaign, and he got nowhere because people are watching Fox News, and that's another problem that we're going to have to face in America. So there is opposition, um, but uh, it's very weak. The last question is about Europe and Ukraine. And there, I think, we really have to look at what's happening in the relationship with Putin, and in particular, the sanctions. So Donald Trump has obviously said that if I get on with Putin, um, we'll have a good relationship, and then presumably it's going to backtrack on the sanctions. But the most recent declaration, and again, we don't know because he changes from one, night, one day to another, the most recent declaration says, no, we're going to keep the sanctions against Russia. But he's also being very bellicose on a number of other places, including Iran, which is very worrying. He said things like he didn't care whether the European Union fell apart, which is, for me, very worrying. He said that NATO people should pay their way, and if not, America's going to withdraw, which, again, is disastrous. Um, and that if people like Latvia and Estonia don't pay away, then whether or not America comes to their aid is going to be contingent upon this new relationship. So it could well be, I mean, okay, let me just summarize it in conclusion lines like this. When people looked at Trump online, in the Twitter, there was a meme that went around, which I thought captured it really quite well. When Ameri people who did American politics looked at Trump, they said there's a real problem for policy. So it's a problem for environmental policy, unemployment policy, policy on, on this, that, or the other. When comparativists looked at Trump, they said it's a problem for authoritarianism. Steve Levitsky and others said it's the rise of elected authoritarianism. When international relations looked at Trump, they said this is a problem of nuclear war and whose finger is on the button, even if it's rather a small finger. So <laughs> you, can, you can take this at three, at three different levels. If you're an Americanist, in some it's, it's fine. You say, well, the Democrats just get their act together and they'll push back and you know, the courts will push back and things will just be back and forth. <clears throat> if you're a comparativist, you think that democracy is going to be hurt, which I, I, I'm in that camp. And if you're an IR specialist, then we all have to practice sitting under our desks again, like they did in the 1950s, because things are so unpredictable. Uh, it could really be... We can't even joke about this, really. I mean, it's just so serious. Um, so time to tell. We're, te we're 10 days in, two weeks in. It feels like a lifetime. Um, I'm sure to all of you as well. So um, we'll see what happens. Well, thank you very much. I think we're... There are many, many more questions that people would love to continue to talk. Um, before we leave, I'd like to also um, recognize and thank our, our colleagues in the Department of Political Science for jointly sponsoring this event. Uh, and let's uh, thanks once again to Pippa Norris uh, for joining us. Please come join us for future seminars. Thanks.